All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jacqueline Callahan, and today I'm here um, in the center of Woodstock, actually at the Golden Notebook Bookstore, and we are so thrilled to be part of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild Forum, and specifically, this is the author series. And today, we're so thrilled to bring you um, locally renowned and wonderful author, raconteur, musician, poet, Sparrow. Some of you may be familiar with him and he has a new book out, Small Happiness. He also has another book called Trump Verse. And today he's going to be sharing some small happiness with you with the help of Robert Warren for musical accompaniment. And um, anyway, it's really all about Sparrow. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sparrow. <coughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, this ovation I'm now receiving. Um, uh, this, so this is my book, Small Happiness, uh, just out from Monkfish. That's a publisher. And it started with an essay I wrote called Small Happiness. This is actually called Small Happiness and Other Epiphanies is the name of this book. So in 2015, I wrote this uh, essay that's a kind of manifesto about my thinking about uh, what did it means to be happy. So I think I'm gonna start by reading the very beginning of the book, which kind of uh, explains small happiness in some sense. Happiness starts small. Learn to recognize it. It's like a weed we see every day, but cannot identify. Small happiness is generous. If you win $12 million, you'll hide it from your friends. But if you're given a free pizza, you'll share it with everyone. If you want big happiness, take LSD. If you want small happiness, wake up early. At 6 a.m., the world hasn't had time yet to generate trouble. The birds tentatively sing. The sun tentatively brightens the sky. The day starts small. Big happiness is visual. Small happiness is oral. Oral in the sense of hearing. We've become a culture so attached to moving images that we've forgotten how to hear. We never turn off all the lights, close our eyes, and listen to Debussy. All music has become background music. New music is even written for this purpose. But listening is a key to small happiness. So the book goes on to elaborate in some sense to uh, give all sorts of somewhat absurd and somewhat brilliant advice, <clears throat> though it's not for me to say. So now I'm gonna read from a later essay within the book, which is a, a guide. It's called 53 Steps to Invigorated Aging. One. As you age, your life contains more nouns and less verbs. The books and trophies on your shelves grow heavier, dustier. You must fight the inertia of time. Verbify yourself. I once read that the average housewife walks 2.3 miles a day just around her house. This strongly influenced me. I decided to hike as much as possible in my apartment to constantly manufacture new tasks for myself. Now I spend my day sharpening pencils, washing two or three dishes, beginning to make the bed, then remembering a poem I've composed but haven't transcribed, such as, and here's a poem, it's called Sad Truth. I searched for love but all I found was happiness. Mm -hmm. Then I pace over to my computer and write it down. 
Then I hop up again to clear off the kitchen table. Two, be willing to look old. Aged faces can be iconic. We live in a culture that despises superannuated people, but loves antiques, a tragic paradox. <laughs> Try to resemble a Victorian lampshade. And now I'm rushing ahead to part 20 of this uh, uh, <laughs> um, a guide to aging. This, is, this part goes, sing archaic songs like Molly Malone. As you age, you have the right to such songs. It is delightful to see a man with a flowing white beard or a woman with deep wrinkles sing Molly Malone. It reaffirms one's faith in the fragile human race. In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. As she wheeled her wheelbarrow through the streets broad and narrow, seeing cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, everybody now. Alive, alive, oh, fly. alive, alive, oh, singing cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. She was a fishmonger, and sure, twas no wonder. That so was her mother and father before they wheeled their wheelbarrow through the streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, everybody now, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, she died of a fever and no one could save her and that was the end of sweet molly malone now her ghost wheels her barrow through the streets broad and narrow crying cockles and mussels alive alive oh, last time here we go alive alive oh alive alive oh crying cockles and muscles alive alive oh take it spiro <laughs> So we're continuing our musical theme here because believe it or not, there's a part of this book entitled How to Be a Singer Songwriter in which I give absolutely crucial advice to any aspiring uh, person who wishes to compose songs. So I'll begin at the beginning of this essay, How to Be a Singer Songwriter. Anyone can be a singer songwriter. It's quite easy. Just think of the last thing you said. For example, we really need to buy lettuce. Then sing it. If you made up a tune, you are a singer-songwriter. If you borrowed a tune, you're still a singer-songwriter because putting new words to old tunes is a perfectly valid form of musical creation. Sing your song again. Now you can add words to it, perhaps about salad dressing or cucumbers. Your song may strike you as inconsequential, but others may love it. For every new song, there is a fan somewhere. Now translate your song into a new language, for example, Serbo-Croatian. Ask a friend who speaks that language to help you pronounce it correctly. Or if you have no such friends, go on YouTube and watch Serbo-Croatian videos. As your next 
at your next open mic, stand up and say, this is a Serbo-Croatian song called Shachlech, which means lettuce. Then sing the song. Afterwards, read the translation. At this point, everyone will either laugh hysterically or look puzzled. Sit down. It's time to write your second song. Let's make this one a little more profound. Open a book at random and copy down a sentence. For example, I just opened Charles Darwin's The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animal and came to this line. Believe it or not, that's a real kind of work by Darwin, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animal. And this is the uh, segment of that that I just found by chance. Instead of walking upright, the body sinks downwards or even crouches and is thrown into flexuous movements. His tail, instead of being held stiff and upright, is lowered and wagged from side to side. His hair instantly becomes smooth. His ears are depressed and drawn backwards, but not closely to the head, and his lips hang loosely. Oh, I see Bonnie Finberg read this book. This is the description of a dog recognizing his master. In fact, that could be the title of your song. A dog recognizes his master. And believe it or not, it's shocking, but Robert Burke Warren has written that song. And here it is. And instead of walking upright, the body sinks downwards or even crouches and is thrown into flexuous movements. His tail, instead of being held stiff and upright, is lowered and wagged from side to side. Here's the chorus. <laughs> A dog recognizes his master. His hair instantly becomes smooth and his ears are depressed and drawn backwards. But not closely to the head and his lips hang loosely. A dog recognizes his master. Take it away, Sparrow. Yes, made me cry. His master. <laughs> so you I thought that was just some absurd idea of mine. Turns out it was actually a brilliant strategy for writing a song. Now, this, uh, this musical and yet literary event continues with one of my probably most central important essays. It's called Dance Your Way to Health. Believe it or not, science has studied the health benefits of dancing. Dancing improves balance and coordination, muscle strength, flexibility, and increases metabolism. The most immediate improvement I find is to the back. Properly executed, gentle undulation relieves lower back distress. You see what I'm doing here? I don't know if you can see it from... Anyway, once you continuously move for 20 minutes, you receive the blessings of aerobic exercise, including cardiovascular enhancement and even better memory. And don't forget mental health. It's hard to be despondent while dancing. A dance doctor examines the patient and prescribes particular movements to improve bodily functioning. 
visit a dance doctor today. And here are some further tips. Recycle dances. Just as one recycles yogurt containers, so may one recycle movement strategies. I, for example, remember numerous dances of the 1960s, the mashed potato, the hully gully, the Freddy, the twist, plus the surreal gyrations of Grateful Dead lovers. All of these find expression in my personal locomotion. Which reminds me, there was a dance by Little Eva called Do the Locomotion. Here's another idea, try the wall dance. This is a freestyle movement in which you must touch a wall at all times, either with your whole body or just your toe or ass or elbow. Play a Czech folk song and do the wall dance. Here's another thought, use the two radio method. Listen to two radios playing two different stations simultaneously. Now do a complex cha-cha to both stations at once. Why not start your own dance craze? Incidentally, there are still new dances, though people over the age of 23 rarely hear of them. One example is the Kiki Challenge, based on a song by Drake. But you can also invent your own dancing styles. Here's one I created the bungalow bop. <laughs> just some of the uh, shorter pieces. <laughs> um, we're just getting raves from our, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, Texts. Chat. Yeah, the chat box. So some of these, uh, some of the uh, small happiness book is uh, small paragraphs, even poems. Um, so I'm going to read some of those right now for your edification. If you find an ant in your house, like a little insect, an ant, you know, you can't 
read it on the page, so I got to explain. I don't mean like if you find your own aunt, the wife of your uncle. If you find an aunt in your house, give it a massage, but very, very gently. This is really, you know, advice to consider carefully. Write a shopping list, then copy it. Exactly duplicate your previous writing. This will help if one day you decide to forge checks. Then there's a note. Note, only in rare circumstances is it ethical to forge checks. And this is, for, this is uh, advice for married people. Remember, you can fall in love with everyone you meet as long as you don't have sex with them. And this is advice for unmarried people. You can fall in love with everyone you meet and have sex with them. Probably you should be in therapy. Let me explain. You know how people nowadays often belong to a health club so they can exercise their bodies? You need a place to exercise your 17 emotions. I'm like the only person really to absolutely define the number of emotions. That's kind of a breakthrough of mine. I mean, I don't know if it's important to you, but to me, it's, I'm a little proud of it. And how do you choose a therapist? Remember, I'm still talking about therapists. The same way you choose a mattress. You want one who's firm but comfortable. Just as a soft bed causes backache, a soft therapist weakens your core values. The path to damnation is nice and straight. The path to wisdom twists and turns. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm gonna read this. I, this is really important. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite stories is about Charlie Parker, the magnificent jazz saxophonist, Charlie Parker. I read it in People Magazine. Charlie was at a jazz club and he turned to his girlfriend. That bass player is great, Charlie Parker said. What are you talking about? She replied, he's awful. You should have heard him two weeks ago, said Bird. The moral is, don't try to be good. Just try to be better than you were two weeks ago. <laughs> be patient with yourself and even more patient with your nephews. <laughs> Find new ways to spend money. For example, suppose the next item you purchase costs $23. Throw a $20 bill and three singles up in the air. Let them float for a moment, then push them in four directions. Finally, with one grand sweep of your arm, gather them up and hand them to the sales clerk. Might take a little practice. I'm not using something you can't necessarily just oh yeah yeah i know i was supposed to revise all this for covid i once shook hands with a man who had shaken hands with wh auden seek out people who've met your heroes write a fictitious yellow pages invent names and phone numbers for dentists plumbers health clubs, nail salons, pharmacies. Buy a treasure chest, place some valuables inside and bury it. Even if it only contains $18, some future kid will be thrilled to find it. Is Robert here somewhere? Right here. You're here. I'm in the green room. Oh yeah, of course. Let me just read this poem. It's called Lavish Mailbox which is really a great name for a poem. Lavish mailbox. Don't buy a house, just buy a mailbox and spend $30,000 renovating it until it's the most lavish mailbox. That's all you need. 
Not a house, just a beautiful mailbox. Ah, one of the few spiritual truths uttered by the Rolling Stones was, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find that you get what you need. I agree, but I would say, if you stop trying. <laughs> Saw her today at the reception. The glass of wine was in her hand. Well, I knew she was going to meet her connection. At her feet was a footloose man. You can't always get what you want. Always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. the demonstration to get my fair share of abuse we were trying to release our frustration can I get a witness because <laughs> if we don't we're gonna blow a 50 amp fuse now listen you can't always get what you want Always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, Sparrow, you might find. from the chat. So 
You can put your questions in the chat and I will relay them to Sparrow and he'll answer them. <laughs> oh, I see. Here yeah. I am. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm prepared for uh, anything now. Please feel free to ask me all about my... Uh, what's your favorite color? What's yeah, my favorite color. Good question. What? Asking yeah, you. when my uh, daughter was young, she would often ask me, what is your favorite color? And I would usually say brown, just because nobody says... Oh, I see, there's a real question. No one ever says brown is their favorite color, and that's why this country is in the mess it is. Uh, so here's a question. Oh, yeah. Um, from Roni Stanley. She says, please tell me what I need. Oh, yeah. Roni wants to know what you need. Oh, hold on. Let me go into a trance. It'll be a very quick trance. Roni. Ah, hmm, hmm. Asparagus. I think it's asparagus. Could be wrong, but I feel I'm feeling asparagus or maybe something that looks like asparagus. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, maybe like uh, asparagus, name? yeah, or Camus. Camus, asparagus, either one, or together. Okay. Yeah, where did my name come okay. from? Okay, yeah, I'm really sick of explaining where my name came from because it's been a long time that I've had it. If it is even a name, I'm not certain that it qualifies as a name. But in 1975, I had my old Jewish name. I mean, I'm really embarrassed about the fact that I'm one of the... 40 million Jews who have changed their name to sound more like they are uh, from England. <laughs> People say to me, oh, Sparrow, your name's like John Sparrow? It's like, oi, what have I done? Anyway, what is my point? That, uh, yeah, I had an old regular Jewish type name and I was working in a natural food store, Gainesville, Florida. Another person with that name, first name came in. Let's say my name was Brad. <laughs> and another Brad came. So like, imagine if my name was Brad. So like people would say, Brad, you know, and then we both run up. So it was like, it was too confusing. So then I decided I will get a name. I'll go to my friend, Jennifer, the princess of love. She just emailed me for my birthday the other day. Like she remembers my birthday. I'm still in touch with Jennifer uh, who gave me the name Sparrow. Like she looked at me just like I'm looking at you right now. She said, uh, in a second, she said, you be Sparrow, you look like a Sparrow. Which I think back then, perhaps I looked slightly more like a Sparrow than I do now. Okay, next question. What is the secret of life? Oh yeah, I heard that, I saw that question. What is the secret of life? Um, okay, let me see, let me read this in this book somewhere. Um, wait a second, the secret of life. Oh, hold on, ah, this is what I opened to. You know what a toe ring is? Like a ring around your toe? I don't know if it's even a real thing. Maybe I invented it. Make a toe ring out of leather. Wear it for two weeks, then decide if you like it. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily the, the secret of life, but it might be a metaphor for what the secret of life is. Secret of life is something like, try out a toe ring, see what happens. You know, in other words, be willing to experiment with your feet. I think, Really, my biggest mistake in life, not that that was exactly the question or that anybody cares, is I've lived really on no money my whole life, amazingly poor my whole life. And um, I'm one of the few people, I like to say that I started out in the lower middle class and through long effort, I worked my way back up into the lower middle class. But really, uh, anyway, I'm basically quite poor. I may, you wouldn't believe how little money I live on. Well, you might believe looking at me. Anyway, what is my point? even though I put on this pretty nice sweater. Um, my big mistake, cheap shoes. Never buy cheap shoes. You've got to spend the money on the shoes. Everything else, and you should, you know, should get good food, but it can be very cheap, good food. Should be cheap. Next question. Is there, <laughs> is there a certain time of day when inspiration strikes for your wittiest writing? My wittiest writing? You're only interested in my wittiest writing, not in my normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill writing? Who, who, uh, what kind of an attitude is that? Well, anyway, here's my point. Um, my point is precisely this. Ah, I don't know when is. I mean, I'm a very ritualized person. I don't know if you could tell from the way I play the guitar, but I'm extremely ritualized. So every day until 12.01 p.m., I do nothing. That is, I don't speak. I don't work. I don't talk to anybody. 
that's the same as speak, I realize. Anyway, I just sort of sit and think, and then I work on my essays. And somehow I finish them sometimes, as you can see in this book. And my other book, we got to promote that other book before we forget. This is my other, I'm publishing three books in one month. The third one I won't trouble you with because I uh, don't have it with me. It's called Trump vs. Alta Books, A-L-T-E. It means old in Yiddish, um, which I am. Anyway, what is my point? Ah, till 1201. That's, so after 1201, I don't, I don't consider myself a writer, but anyway, I don't do anything. Whether inspiration strikes or not, I don't believe in inspiration. I believe in something else. Uh, desperation. <laughs> I say art is 99% desperation, 1% inspiration. Sparrow, do you call your home my nest? My nest? Uh, no, I never call my home. A, I, mean, I don't make many bird puns. I don't really think of myself as a bird. I forget that I'm a bird once in a while. Actually, here's one weird thing that happened to me. When I moved out of New York City, we were like, uh, you know, loading up the car to, to move to New York City out of the East Village in 1998. And as I'm walking to the car, next to the car is a dead sparrow. And I'm like, whoa, a dead sparrow. That seems like it might mean something. But other than that, I don't think, oh yeah, I'm a bird. My house is a nest. My arms are wings. My <laughs> head is a crest. I'm writing a poem, a rhyming poem for you. And what do you care? Not much, obviously. Anyway, I'm sorry to insult you. This is like my only uh, talent is insulting my, my few fans. And I apologize. Heather Hutchison wants to know, <laughs> how can I be happier than you? Happier than me? It's very easy. How to be happy? That's a really good question. I don't know. I'm having in my mind, I'm thinking of you like peeling. I'm not, I guess I'm hungry because all I'm thinking about is food. I, I think if you just like peel... Um, Vegetable peel, what am I thinking of? Peeling like a, uh, a papaya. Just, just buy a papaya, peel it, but very slowly and kind of sensually. And uh, then you'll be happier than me, probably forever. Like it, you just do it once, it has some kind of magical, I mean, I'm a believer sort of in magic, something like shamanic uh, leisure domain, you know that word, leisure domain, like, like magic, you know, in the word for like, a, like a magician tricks. Anyway, try, um, another thing is to like go to a canal, just like go to the nearest canal. I think there's one in High Falls and just stand, it's not in action anymore. It's not in use, but it's still a canal. Just go to the canal, just stand by the canal for about 23 minutes. And then you should be happier than me, at least for a week. I don't know how happy I, I can't tell if I'm happy. I seem happy, I know. I'm sort of manic, really. I don't know if that's the same as happy. Here's another question. <laughs> Is there a particular reason you chose to live on High Street? <laughs> yeah, I never take any drugs. I don't know if that's uh, clear. I don't, I'm sure you'll all be disappointed in me, but I, I, you know, including, you know, even nice drugs. Like, I think the best drug, if you're asking me, I've, I have, have strong feelings about this. The best drug is definitely psilocybin mushrooms. In my experience, my vast experience as a kind of amateur drug taker. Um, but I never take any drugs since 1981. I did go to a kava bar, you know, kava, some kind of uh, Pacific Islands. It's a Pacific Ocean, like a Samoan ritualistic uh, drink. Like typically you chew the root and you spit it out into a big vat. That's why the missionaries didn't like it. They discouraged it. But I went to a kava bar in uh, the East Village about six months ago before everything ended. And uh, I drank some kava and ultimately I didn't like it. Even kava is too much for me. I don't like drugs. I don't live on high street because I want to get high. Uh, although, you know, I do just something about, well, you know, in England, they, they, Main Street is always, they call it Main Street of every town, the High Street. I was on the High Street. Have you been on the High Street today? I kind of like that term, the High Street. So I, that's probably the reason I moved there. I moved there because my in-laws bought me the house. I shouldn't admit that to you, but I'm overly, what's the word, truthful. So really, I'm a kind of bourgeois faker, really. <laughs> 
questions. Two more questions. Okay. Are you thinking of running for president on a third party ticket? Good question. Am I running for president on a third party ticket? I am running for president. I always forget that I'm running for president. I don't know what, what's the word uh, party I'm with. I think I forgot to invent a party this year. I've, this is my eighth campaign for president. I always tell people, don't vote for me. And there's, as far as I know, only one person in all of history in my eight campaigns has voted for me, my friend Janet. And I think she voted for me just to piss me off. But uh, please do not vote for me. Vote for Biden. He's, he, I'm starting to really love Biden. I know my friends all, whatever, distrust me for this emotion. I think there's hope. There's always hope. There's even hope for Trump. Maybe now that he has this disease, he's gonna turn around. I mean, but you have to vote him out. I don't care. There's not that much hope. You know, you have to vote for Biden. Biden, there's hope. Look at the FDR, look at whatever, various people. LBJ was a, he ended racism. Okay, maybe not completely, but he did his best. And you know, who would have who would have guessed looking at LBJ? He was a complete cynical asshole. And he made the biggest, what's the word, strides in civil rights. And you know, Biden could do that particularly if you and I fight, fight, fight. We have to fight to save the earth. Don't listen to all this nonsense that I'm writing. Just do something important, but buy the book because my publisher um, is uh, pressuring me. <laughs> I'm, you know, you might enjoy it, who knows? It makes a good gift for somebody. There's gotta be someone that wants this book, let's face it. Um, one comment <laughs> for the last question. Um, someone, Mark Cantor says, Sparrow, coincidentally, Asparagus Camus was the name of my prog rock band. <laughs> yeah, Asparagus Camus is the name of most people's prog rock band. Okay. Well, Final yeah. Final question. Oh, yeah, okay. Did it take you more than one lifetime to write this masterpiece? More than one lifetime? That's a very good question. I mean, I have no idea. You know, I mean, I am in a yoga group. You know, that's what I do. I meditate twice a day. I do yoga once a day. I was supposed to do it twice a day, but I cheat. I'm in the Ananda Marga Society. You know, supposedly I've had whatever, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in anything, as is obvious, except I believe in voting for Biden. That's the one thing, I'm only thing on earth. You know, is there a God? Does the, do, do we really exist? Somebody told me yesterday, there's a, there's a conspiracy theory that everybody died in 2012. <laughs> And that's why everything is the way it is. We're all dead. That seems entirely possible to me. But what is my point? Ah, I don't believe in anything. I don't know how many lifetimes, in other words. I think probably I wrote this book, to be honest, over the course of about 17 lifetimes. But most of it I wrote in this lifetime because it's very topical. You know, like uh, the latest dance. I didn't give you the dance from 432 BC. I gave you the dance to the Drake song. That part I could only have written in this life. That's why we live in this, in this universe is to like keep experiencing new pop songs. That's the secret of life. I've just figured it out. Well, I answered the wrong question. Each question answers, each of my answers answers a different question. That's the trick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and with that. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to Robert Burke Warren, yes. the amazing Robert amazing. Burke Warren, RBW, and the amazing and eternal Sparrow. <laughs> um, and if you're enjoying this program today, please, 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 please consider making a donation to the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild on their website, Woodstock guild.org um the guild does and has done so much in our community many of you visited birdcliff many of you in times before this have enjoyed wonderful wonderful readings at the kleiner james art center for the arts right now there's an incredible exhibit up right now for zuma steel please please support the woodstock birdcliff guild we really we really need our community support so everyone thank you so much for enjoying this event today. I know I did. And we will see you soon. And please go to woodstockguild.org for more events and again to donate. Have a great evening. 
And happy birthday, Judith Carmen. Good night. Oh, what a triumph, huh?